forced air systems. And we're still talking about moving air to a duct and how do we size duct properly. Uh, we, say we, we said that we have to size the duct properly for two main reasons. First reason is uh, the pressure drop. If you have a lot of pressure drop due to friction and losses, you will have to compensate for that by increasing the inducer fan pressure and that will cause you to lose a lot of energy. Second part is noise. Noisy duct and noisy airflow is not something people prefer. So we want to reduce the noise as much as possible. And uh, again, from the beginning, from week one, we said that the heating system should always be uh, unnoticeable. You should not hear it, feel it, or uh, see it. I mean, the more passive it is, the better. So friction also doesn't work due to actual rubbing action between the air and the duct. And that's why when we use spiral duct or uh, extended duct, flexible duct, we have a lot of noise. And that's why we try to limit that to six feet or 10 feet maximum. So the smoother the duct interior surface, less friction there is, and that will also reduce the pressure losses for the duct. And if the air is moving slower, that means also less friction because friction and pressure loss is a function of the, the pressure. Uh, and the more ridges we have, the more corners, the more sharp turns we have, the more losses we will have inside the air. The difference between air and water again is the compressibility. And water, uh, air has more possibility of making noise and vibration. Yeah. So if you have um, a curved rectangular elbow, would it be easier on the airflow than if you had it just a square elbow? Uh, ask me that again. What do you mean by rectangular? So like, um, it's cause you know how uh, some of the for rectangular duct, the, uh, the round elbow. Yeah. It would be um, harder on the, um, the airflow if you just if you had an elbow, but it was square and it wasn't that round curve. Yeah. So the, the more the more curvature you have, the better. Mm -hmm. And some of them actually have veins inside to facilitate the, the flow. Mm -hmm. So that uh, you do you want to avoid ninety degrees where you have a sudden stop and like sharp, sharp turn. Yeah, sharp turns are really like difficult for the air, and this is where you have a lot of stagnation points. And the problem with those stagnation points is the air does not move, and eventually it will be a good area to deposit a lot of debris and dust, and also to sometimes use some, uh, cause some kind of echo or vibration. Uh, each foot of duct offers a known uh, resistance to airflow, and that is always provided by the chart. Uh, so there are always used number of friction losses per 100 feet of duct I'm giving to you by these uh, calculation rules. So they have a lot of information here, basically to tell you what is the size that you should not exceed based on the amount of maximum friction losses and also the size of the duct. And again, the velocity of the air is a function of the size of the duct. If you increase the size, you'll have slower velocity. Uh, these uh, frictional charts, these are the charts, or sometimes the rulers, uh, they give you the pressure drop and the uh, optimum size for the duct. Uh, all length and equivalent length are added together to achieve the total. Remember equivalent length? That's converting fittings into actual length. So you can use the equivalent length method. There's a similar one for duct, but we're not going to go through. That will give you complete total length and friction and losses. So a six inch round duct delivers 100 CFM to the space. That's a general rule. So probably people who do a lot of sheet metal and they work with duct, they will tell you, usually for six inches, you want 100 CFM. So if you have a rule that requires more than 100 CFM, putting one six inches duct is not going to be enough. It will be enough, you can pump air through it, however it will be too fast and it will be too noisy and it's uh, not the proper distribution. Eight inches duct can give you 200, so that's the that's diameter. Uh, and again, it's round duct, can give you 200 so you can, for that space with, uh, without a lot of losses and friction and a lot of noise. Common problem you'll see is excessive long flexible duct pumps. This is uh, very common, we have this in the top here. It's too long for the plenum we have. We have a plenum coming to the middle of the room. Then we have a few flexible
flexible ducts. And those flexible ducts connect those registers. Even though the register is big, the duct is very small, so you have a sudden expansion and you cannot achieve the, uh, the advantage you want from a larger duct system. So most of those uh, flexible ducts are little <coughs> small registers here, and the big ones are the same size, just bigger size for no reason. So that's not really a good design. In a good design, you want the duct to match the register size, or, or at least you can have some kind of gradual expansion so you can get of uh, uh, air distribution. So, uh, does anybody know about uh, wake angle? Mm -hmm. Wake. Like if you have a flow coming out straight and suddenly goes into a big expansion. And, uh, I thought that was static pressure. So if you have flow coming through an expansion, you'll have something called wake angle here, which uh, basically, if you've ever been in a boat, sail boat, or something of that sort, you'll have a wake angle which kind of pulls you back because it has a lot of swell. And this uh, also happens with air. If you have sudden expansion, this will cause you to have a vacuum that vacuum will pull back and uh, flow. So the reason I'm bringing that up is you don't want to have very sudden expansion, you want to be more gradual. <coughs> uh, so steep long flexible duct runs is uh, another issue for ducts. Distributed duct runs, what does that mean? You have duct coming all the way here, then it just flows. This one is annoying. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is annoying. What is that? Can we fix it? I mean, I thought that was hammering. No, it's hammering, but we're not touching any of the systems. Anyway. But this is why you said. You said it's not like certified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, this is not like certified. Don't be assassin now. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just saying, like, you can't facilitate it. You cannot do it in the same way. But this is really annoying. I sympathize. Let's get this quickly so we can leave. Yeah. I didn't even notice it until you pointed it out. Huh? Yeah! <laughs> 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 I was like, I was like, I was paying attention to it. Okay. So this connected duct runs is when you have a long duct running with pressure, then you suddenly cut it off. So you cut it off, it's going to be a lot of pressure pushing against the vacuum and it makes pressure and it's not really productive. Close dampers. You want to close the dampers as close to the register as possible. I mean, as close as to the plenum as possible because if you have the rough air running through an empty pipe, it will just give you a lot of uh, excess pressure. Glass flexible ducts that will cause a lot of noise, but basically making a big fluid out of uh, a vent. Loose insulation in the duct that will rattle a lot and uh, will cause it to have a lot of noise. You'll have a lot of people complaining about noise. Just like we are complaining about this noise now. Because it's really, imagine you're not living with that for a long time. You need to be in antidepressant. So, wow. I'm not kidding you. It does happen. That's not people who work in big, uh, big uh, factories, a lot of consistent noise like that. You don't notice it, but it's going to bring you down somehow. People also, with uh, back in the day, when they used to have heart valves that clicks. Imagine with every heartbeat you click. It just messes with your mind. And eventually, you have to be an antidepressant. But luckily, now they have valves that do not click. That's so weird. Uh, lock drills and registers. If you have, if you ever been in a in a house where you have one register that is clogged, probably you can hear a lot of air pushing through it and it becomes very very noisy. Same thing when you're in the car and you have your AC blasting and you close all the three vents and you leave one open, it's going to be really noisy because the lock has increased a lot. So for commercial duct systems, each area has specification regarding the required amount of airflow. Makes sense. Uh, there are some ducts actually you can drive a car through it. And they're so big. If you go into New York City or Boston, and they have big air handling units in the basement, you will hear a lot of noise. And uh, I've seen ducts like big enough, you can drive a car through it, and a big huge fan to deliver the air around the building. Certified visiting and balancing company to verify the airflow and noise. You need people who actually will go and verify if the airflow is adequate and if there are, it's not excessive noise. 
uh, especially in coach rooms or theaters or places where you do up well, all these buildings, you don't want it to have a lot of building, a lot of noise. And if you go in the basement, probably you need some hearing aids where it's very, very loud. Uh, floor looks bigger than air volume and added supply register. If you were in the health class, you probably use the hood to put uh, cover the register and give you the airflow. Uh, total airflow can be measured in the main duct. How do you measure the flow in the main duct? You don't have velocity, velocity meter or a hood to put in there. What are you going to do? How do you know which one's the main duct? It's the biggest one at the bottom of the building. How do you measure the flow in there? You say you don't have what? Velocity? Yeah, you can't insert anything in there. It's a big duct. What are you going to do? Yeah, that's manometer. The you put the manometer inside and you measure the pressure, the velocity pressure, and based on that you can measure the uh, air velocity. Uh, common problem include dirty filters, partially closed dampers, and incorrect fan rotation. Incorrect fan rotation is very, very common. Do not disregard that. Sometimes the fan is not turning the right way and it could be a problem with the airflow. Uh, some dampers do not close fully, so that will leak some air and disturb your pressure flow in the duct system. How could the fan just randomly stop going the right way? Uh, somebody replaced the fan and put the blade the wrong way. Okay. That's why it always tells you this way outside, and they put an arrow on it. So it does happen sometime where you, where you replace the fan and put it the wrong way and reverses the flow, could be an issue. <coughs> If you ask Billy, he can tell you at least four or five stories about that. Uh, okay, so some companies, when they send you as a professional to go and investigate the noise control, what are you going to do? This is how you calculate the noise in decibels. If anybody plays music, probably you know that all the, all the noise is the measured in decibels. If you have a phone, you can download an app called the Noise Meter which can measure for the decibels for you. I can bring my phone now and show you what is the noise uh, level. So quiet level is around 30 decibels. 40, 50 is too much. So this equation you can use to know if you have a lot of decibels or something is intolerable. So sound power in decibels, air velocity, you plug into this equation. It has to be a meter per second, so you have to convert that. And area is the duct sectional area in meter square. And that will give you the noise level in decibels. And again, I have a chart here that will show you what is acceptable and what is not. Can you go back quickly? Yeah. I still want to bring my decibel meter and listen to this noise. So 30, around 30, no, 30 decibels, that's considered to be quiet, moderately loud, between 30 and 60, that's up to when you have a conversation. Between 70 and 60, you will require to have some OSHA certification and limitation to how much you will be exposed to that. So, average exposure is around 80, snowmobiles, 100, 120, at the end, Jet takeoff is 150, that's very loud. So, I'm not going to reach that three feet. Huh? Fire at three feet. <laughs> that's pretty close. Yeah, that's, uh, that's intense. Okay. <laughs> so, if you were to go somewhere in, a, in an AC company or a heat company, use force air, and you want to go and check the, the decibels, it's a good way to know 
if this is too loud or too or, or acceptable, and you can report back. And uh, you will get a lot of issues about uh, knocking and about noise. I got this three or five phone calls this winter just about this noise. And I had to ask them to record it because it comes and goes. So whenever I go there, there's no noise. When I leave, there's noise. So if you can please record it. I turned out to be a steam radio that keeps knocking in the middle of the night. How about knocking in the middle of the night? Temperature drop, temperature drop, that's when they turn the heat up, and the time keeps dropping higher than it's supposed to. This chart here you can use to supplement for these uh, rulers, and it tells you what is the air going to deliver, and this is the dimension you can use for rectangular or round up. And so if you need to size that system, you can use this chart. And that's all I have for airflow. Uh, the next class we will do the most common problems in heat system, just to get exposed to some of the things that you might face in a heat system.